Welcome back to Polygamy, What Love Is This? We're broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah, where the fullness of the gospel of Joseph Smith is lived out daily by the polygamy groups here. We are a program dedicated to the subject of polygamy, and we thank each of you for joining us tonight and invite you to ask your questions and make your comments regarding historical or contemporary polygamy. I would like to remind all viewers who may be in a polygamous group. In the United States of America, it's a felony to practice polygamy. You're breaking the law, but you already knew that. I'm not telling you something that you don't know. But I do want to remind you of something maybe you don't know, and that is that one of your prophets, Orson Hyde, proclaimed that all those who want to live this doctrine and find that it's not legal in the land that they live, they are obliged not to live it or migrate to a country where it is legal. However, it seems to me that it would be a much more sensible solution if you all just abandon the false doctrine of salvation through polygamy and turn to the true doctrine of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. We are a live telephone call-in program and we will be opening the telephone lines a little bit later for you to call in and ask your questions or make your comments. You might want to jot down the phone number. It's 801-973-8820. We also have a web page about polygamy.com where you can go and get answers or you can find resources, information about polygamy. And if you click on the link about the streaming video, you can get previous programs there. You might want to tell friends or relatives who are unable to receive this program if they're out of the viewing area, and they can go on the web page and watch the previous programs as well. We also have a email that we would like invite you to email uh, tv at aboutpolygamy.com. If you have questions, confidential uh, questions will be answered in a confidential matter. I would like to take this time to offer an apology to one of the callers who called in last week. Chino from Taylorsville telephoned and asked us if there was any way we could help him. He said he's a 38-year-old man and he would like to get a couple of young brides and wanted to know if we would help him do that. And I promptly told him we help people leave groups, not join them, and then thanked him for calling and hung up. However, if I, as I've been thinking about this, I realized that I really should have given Chino a better answer. My answer to you, Chino, is polygamy is not the way to heaven. Only Jesus Christ is, so why not turn to Him instead of your brides for your heavenly bliss? And also, Chino, we'd like to offer you a Bible study. You are invited to come to a Bible study where we can sit down and go through all the biblical passages that speak about polygamy and about God's way of salvation. And Chino, we will be praying for you, and we do thank you for calling last week. This week's quote from Early Mormon Polygamy or about early Mormon polygamy is from a early Mormon prophet, Heber C. Kimball. And I'm sure you probably all know about him or heard about him, but perhaps you did not know that Heber C. Kimball had 45 wives. Heber Kimball made this comment as he was speaking to a group of missionaries that were getting ready to go out on their missions. And this is what he said, quote, Brethren, I want you to understand that it is not to be as it has been before. The brother missionaries have been in the habit of picking out the prettiest women for themselves before they get here and bringing on the ugly ones for us. Hereafter, you have to bring them all here before taking any of them and let us all have a fair shake. Now, in the Journal of Discourses, Heber C. Kimball made the same remark to the same group of missionaries uh, and this is what he said, do not make selections before they are brought home and put into the fold. The mindset of the early polygamous men seems to regard women as merchandise or animals to put into the fold and to pick and choose the ugly and the pretty and to put the ugly aside and bring the pretty ones on for them. He already had 45 wives and how does that make you feel, ladies? Although the selecting is done differently in present-day polygamy groups, the mindset and the process is basically the same. And to all women, I say, all women who are in polygamy groups, I would like to say this to you. 
You were not made for this. God didn't do this for you. God has better and sweeter plans for you. And don't, uh, my advice is not, not to walk, but to run from a kind of a group that teaches, uh, treats you this way. And if you don't know where to go or don't know quite what to do, go to www.shieldandrefuge.org. That's shieldandrefuge.org, and you will get some help there on what to do. Tonight we have a very special guest. He's a very, very special person, a true trophy of God's grace. Whenever God can bring someone who has been in the spiritual depths of darkness of a polygamy group and bring them out to the beautiful truth of salvation in Jesus Christ, it is nothing short of a miracle. And such is the case with tonight's guest. To be honest with you, this man was such a faithful and loyal member of the polygamy group he was in, I had the smallest hope that he would ever leave. But God had different plans. He is a great and awesome God, and he laid it upon this man's heart to begin seeking for the truth, and that's what he did. But I'll let him tell you the story from the Kingston Polygamy Group. We welcome Paul Owen. Thank you, Doris. Thank you, Paul, for being here. We sure do appreciate it. Uh, before we go to the subject that you have on your mind that you want to talk about tonight, let's just briefly cover how you managed to leave the group, why, why you left, and, and uh, what it was that precipitated your choice to leave. Well, part of it was the fact that I was truly committed to the original leader, the one that was there when I grew up and knew. And when he died, I had a, a hard time accepting the new leader. But I did. I figured it was my responsibility to accept him, and I did. But I could see so many things that just weren't right. I could tell weren't from God. And so different things happened, and I decided that I needed to know a little bit more than just to follow without even questioning, which is what you're taught to do, is don't yes. even question if, if you don't agree. And through the process of studying the scripture and a lot of prayer, I found the truth. And there's a lot of, uh, oh, different situations that I run into with my work that I just couldn't seem to make it financially because they, a group like that keeps you on a very low salary or wage and uh, I was having a hard time so I decided to go on cash basis only instead of the system that they had set up which was to buy and sell through them and not even transfer money just have what they call a service slip system mm -hmm. and uh, I it just seemed like they could take things away from me so much that uh, I had to get control. So I went on a cash basis and then ultimately had my house put on a separate contract. When I bought a house in South Jordan, which was about 19 years ago, the first thing they wanted me to do was to sign the house over to the group. And that's what they do. Which uh, they do with everybody <coughs> that, that buys real estate. And my wife fortunately wouldn't do that. At that time I would have. But she wouldn't, and so I didn't, but it wasn't very long after that that I could see that things just weren't like I thought they were. Mm -hmm. And so when I went in to, have the, to sign the papers, to have the house put on a separate contract, the leader came in. He says, do you realize that doing this means you're not going to have another statement? And I don't know if I realize that or not. Or if having, not having another statement would mean I would not any, no longer be a member. But the Holy Spirit gave me such a peace about it that... When he asked me that, I said, yes. He says, is that what you want? I said, yes. He left. I signed the papers and left the only life that I'd ever known. And I was 57 when I left that group. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that they, they base so much on spiritual matters and <clears throat> your salvation, and yet they don't care if you walk away from their salvation? Yeah. They don't seem to care. When you left, did you have family and friends that stayed behind? My own individual family, my children, uh, are all out as well. They all left, those who were still there left with me. Good. And, uh, but I have brothers and sisters that stayed in. That mm -hmm. uh, Did they give you any advice or say anything to you? Oh, on I had your one choice? sister that called me and tried to convince me that I was wrong, but uh, she didn't talk very hard. And then my oldest brother, who I figured would have tried to talk me out of it, never said a word to me. Hmm. But then he made the statement one time that his brothers and sisters are in the group. So <laughs> I guess I was not his brother anymore. Oh dear. 
Um, have they treated you well since that time? Well, when I see them, it's not that bad. But, uh, they're very cold and... Hmm. Interesting. Some, have, some suffer complete ostracization when, when they leave a group like that and can't talk to anybody when they leave. Many people were amazed that you took the radical step of walking away like you did. And frankly, I was very <laughs> shocked when I heard about it. I was very glad, but shocked. What advice would you say to those people right now? To search for the truth, to look in, study the Bible. Because the Bible has all the answers. It does. Just it search for the does. truth. What regrets do you have of leaving? Absolutely none. None? Not one. Neither do I. And did anyone warn you not to leave? Yeah, my sister did. She told me that it wouldn't be a good thing if I did, but I, it was too late then. <laughs> I already found the truth. So. <laughs> you couldn't stick around when you got the truth. When we're born and raised in a polygamy group like this, and their salvation plan involves living polygamy as a requirement, we believe it. And we believe it for many reasons. One of the reasons is that we all, that's all we've ever learned. We have only have a choice of one. Another reason is that our parents taught us and they believed it and, and our extended family taught us and they lived it and believed it. And how could so many people be wrong? And how could they teach us a lie? But once we're out of there, as Paul just mentioned, and once we begin studying the Bible and we find out the, the facts for ourselves and the truths for ourselves, we understand that they've been doing mind manipulations on us. And that the things, the doctrines that they taught us in the Bible really were not in the Bible as they claimed that they were. And we realize that their teachings were not factual, not biblical, and are amazed that we ever really believed what we'd been taught. Paul, you have a label that you'd like to apply to these techniques that you wanted to talk about tonight. What is that label and how do they learn to use it so effectively? Well, it's, it's the mind control that they have that is so strong that uh, it just, well, you're, you're there from birth and you learn these things, you, that's what they teach you, you're taught that way by your parents and then by the group, same thing over and over again and you just believe that it's true and you, you feel like if you don't live that way, why well, you're going to hell. And that's what they told me if I left the group, that that would happen to me. And, and if you uh, have any doubts and then you kind of linger on those doubts, you get a huge sense of Fear and guilt, at well, least I did when I had that. When I found Jesus, when he came into my heart, all the guilt that I had felt from leaving was gone, and it's never come back. It's washed away, <laughs> clean away. It's washed away. God's good, huh? Yes, um, is. There is a long list of practices that uh, we need to watch out for in, determine, in determining a group that is practicing mind control, religious mind control. And you've chosen a few of those techniques that you want to talk about tonight. And there's quite a really a long list, but we're only going to deal with some of them. And the first one that you wanted to talk about, Paul, is that they claim to be the only true church. And the only true group, everyone on the outside, is considered of the devil. Yeah, that's, that's the way we were taught, and that's the way uh, we believe. That just that, I mean, you look at it after, not, after you're not there anymore, and to see... A little tiny group of people like that, the only people in the world that God cares about, that just doesn't even make sense. It doesn't. So I, I asked that when I was a youngster to my mother, wondering, and I asked her that question, and uh, I didn't get a very good answer, but she did try to answer it. Did you ever ask the question? Uh, yeah, but uh, they said that it was going to grow to where it included the whole world. Oh. So that's oh. what their I didn't get thought that was answer. that they would do. I didn't get that answer at all. They claim to only ha to have the only true prophets on earth. Is that what yes, you heard that's, too? Yes, that's what they claim. And uh, well, you just like I say, you taught that way from birth. You believe it, but you w look at them, especially after coming out of there, and look at the way they do and the way they talk and the things that go on. Why well, you wonder how you could ever believe such a how thing? How could you ever have believed it after you're out of there? That's true. I'd l like to remind you all that we. Uh, we'll have the telephone lines open in a little bit. If you want to jot down the phone number, it's 801-973-TV20. And we will take your, begin taking your calls in just a few minutes. Uh, one of the, the uh, false teachings that they give us for manipulating the mind and the mind control is they deify man 
or they make man into a god or will become one. They humanize God. In other words, they limit God to a body. And so what they're doing is they're bringing man up to the level of God and bring God down to the level of man, basically. And they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Would you like to expound yeah. some on that? Well, one thing about, about that, uh, when you think about it, if, if we can become gods and we can become equal with Jesus Christ, how can we worship somebody that's on no, level, no higher level than we are? And there's only one God. There's only always been one God. Mm -hmm. and there only ever will be one God. Mm -hmm. And that's Jesus Christ. Right. And when I was doing my studying and I came across that fact in the Bible that Jesus Christ is God, um, I was, t I, I cannot find words to explain what that did to me. I was so shocked. What did it, how did you react when you found that out? Well, being in the group, you didn't read the Bible that much. It was focused on the Mormon literature and that's more mainly what you studied and they, they hardly ever bring up things in the Bible and, the, and they claim the Bible was only true in as much as it's translated correctly. Mm -hmm. But God says that his word cannot be changed. And they twist the parts of the Bible that they do uh, bring, they twist into so that it will meet and match their own doctrines. Yeah, that's right. Um, I was taught that Jesus was striving to become a God, that he was earning his Godhood, and was told that before he could become a God, he had to die on the cross for the earth, and that was part of his way of earning his Godhood. And after I became a Christian, this is what my mother told me, and I know my mom taught a lot of things other people didn't teach. But after I became a Christian, I realized that that completely took the sacrificial, uh, self-sacrificing um, aspect of the, of, the, of the atonement and put it into a self-serving uh, mm -hmm. thing that Jesus did. Were you taught that? Yes, we, but, uh, we're taught that Jesus is our brother and that he's Satan's brother. Yeah. But the Bible says that God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. He's never changed. So their idea, they, they have the theory that you, it's uh, e continual progress. You've got to keep earning your way higher and higher and higher until you finally become a god. And Mormon scriptures teach that God remains yeah. the same yesterday, yeah, today, was, and forever as well. That was uh, one thing that Brigham Young stressed very strongly was that uh, man can become God. Uh -huh. and God was once a man. Right, right. But God is right. spirit and Jesus, Jesus Christ spirit. is God. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is God. And there is only one God. There are not three gods. Uh, someone made the remark one time uh, that kind of hit me um, right, to be right on. And that was the remark that the cults uh, it seems like they all believe that everybody can become God except Jesus. <laughs> and doesn't that seem to be the way it is? They don't allow Jesus to be God, but we sure can become one. Yeah. Well, Jesus is God, and there's no denying I mean, denying it doesn't make it uh, so that it isn't true. In fact, I'd like to make an offer right now. I have uh, a list of 27 passages in the Bible that teaches that there's only one God, that there's always been only one God, and that there will always be only one, anywhere and everywhere and ever. And anyone who would like a list of those 27 passages, if you would email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com, I would be happy to send you the list of those 27 passages. Now, th I'm sure this isn't exhaustive. I'm sure there's more in the Bible than just these 27, but it sure is a good place to get started. Um, so our phone lines are open. We do have a call coming in from Susan in Davis County. Let's take that call and then we'll go into some more questions. Hello, Susan. Hello, Doris. Hello. Welcome to our show tonight. Thank you. I missed the beginning of it. I just happened to tune in and I don't know your background, but I want to thank you for helping people if indeed you're able to influence others to get out of polygamy. And I want to say that um, in order to assure your credibility, though, please make the distinction that the current LDS Church is nothing to do with polygamy and we find it deplorable. It was out a hundred, more than a hundred years ago. This started up in 1929, these polygamous groups have nothing to do with us at all and we can't stand that, that they claim so. We would ask you to please make the distinction because the doctrines you're talking about in fundamentalism are not our doctrines and please make that distinction. 
Well, Susan, I thank you for your call. We do get uh, several people who say that, and we do not lump the Mormons in together with the modern-day fundamentalists. And I don't know that the fundamentalists do that either. However, as we study this particular subject of polygamy, we do go back into early Mormon history, and that early Mormon history includes polygamy, and we can't help but do that. So of course. We, don't, uh, we don't lump it in today's uh, Mormon church, but uh, we don't also deny that the fact that it did once uh, happen with the Mormons. So we do thank you for we your are, call, We are, and we don't want to be labeled as that. And on the screen it said Mormon fundamentalists. There is no such thing. If they're fundamentalists, they are no longer longer Mormon. They were excommunicated if they tried to do that. Okay. Well, we do appreciate your call, Susan. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next uh, point that we have on religious mind control, mind manipulation, is that they have absolute loyalty to their leadership. And they are to avoid any questioning of what their leaders say. That's very true. That's what they believe. And, and if, uh, if the leader says something, no matter what it is, it comes from God. You just believe that it came from God. And, and so that's just the way it was. Uh, Did I you, was, oh, excuse me, go ahead. I was so committed all my life that he asked me to do a lot of things that I sure didn't want to do, almost cost me my family. But I felt like that's, that I had to do just because of that fact that you're, you're committed to the group and to the leadership mm -hmm. and they have uh, a law that they believe and that's that a law called one above another that one per the person that you're working for you got to obey him no matter what he says and what he has to obey the one over him and so forth so if you don't then you're going against their policy and and what they teach were there many times that the, that obeying the one above another was contradictory in what they were saying to do? Well, contradictory in what was right with to do. With themselves? Within well, yes, themselves. Yes, within though. themselves it wasn't. A, uh -huh. I can't think of anything specific, but uh, yeah, it was. Did they hold to the idea that one, once the decision has been made, your thinking has been done for you? Yes, absolutely. Did you ever have the audacity to go against anything that they thought? <laughs> no, uh, the people my age and my age group more or less did what we were told at that time, we, you're told to work someplace, you go there to work. You're told to do something, you go do it. I was sent to a coal mine when I was 15 years old. Didn't even get an education because that's where they, where they told where me they to want go. You to be. And uh, do they still do that to the youngsters? They do, but the youngsters just aren't that committed. Doesn't seem like from what I saw just before I left, seemed like a lot of them wouldn't even ask where they should work or, or worry about that. They'd go out and and find a job that they wanted. Mm -hmm. Well, that's dangerous. Wasn't getting quite out as there committed and being as able to <laughs> see life, huh? <laughs> what about guilt? What what do they do? What do these cult mind controls? Well, that's a lot of a lot of mind control is the guilt. The fact that if you don't if you don't uh, do what they say, you feel guilty, and that guilt is built into you from from birth. Did you have guilt for even wrong feelings or wrong thoughts that you didn't act? Uh, <laughs> When I started questioning, I had a lot of a lot of that and trying to decide what was right and what was wrong, and I struggled with it quite a bit. But the farther I got and the more I learned, the more I could see things that was wrong, and I'd put them on the shelf for so long, but then pretty soon that wouldn't do it anymore, mm -hmm. and I had to know the truth. Mm -hmm. Good. I, I struggled with guilt a lot um, for various reasons, various things, but it's, it's debilitating sometimes. And I'd stuff it, and until I, for 25 years, until I found the truth and found Jesus, uh, and then it started coming out and I realized what was going on inside. Uh, we have another call coming in on line one. Um, Douglas from Mapleton. I'm not scripted. Hello, is this Douglas? Welcome to our show. What can we help you with? Yes, I was just curious. Um, do the uh, fundamentalists in the Kingston group, do they consider themselves as Christians, or do they like to separate themselves from Christianity? Paul, do you want to take that? Yeah, they uh, do consider themselves to be Christians, to, but not to the extent that we understand it. They... Uh, they don't emphasize that all that much. Uh, but yeah, they do claim to be Christians. I see, because I'm 
was uh, just watching the news at noon today, and I see the where the uh, Mormon Church is uh, suing the fundamentalists, or not suing them, but asking them to not use the Mormon term because they have it, you know, trademark, and yet they want to be called Christians. And when you're talking with them, they say, "Well, we're Christians. We're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints." Yet they want to also be called Mormons, and it's just kind of real confusing to me. I think it's very confusing, especially when the fundamentalists actually believe in the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, uh, basic early Mormonism. It's all there. Every bit of it is there. So they're, they are actually are living Mormonism as it, in its true form, its original form. Yes, and uh, that's why the, the first caller kind of uh, was misleading because they still have Section 132 in their Doctrine and Covenants and they still practice it, not publicly and not in this life, so to speak. They do still practice it, polygamy that is. So, you know, it's just kind of confusing to me. It's confusing to a lot of people and we understand what you're saying. It's confusing sometimes to us if we didn't know the truth of the scriptures, it would be confusing. But thank you, Chris, we appreciate your call. You're welcome. Aha, uh -huh. bye. I think that was Douglas. Okay, we have Chris from Salt Lake City. He has a question about divorce. Hello, Chris. Hi. Hello, welcome to our show. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, yeah, I just had a question. If a woman were to come to the knowledge of the truth and they're starting to learn that polygamy was a lie and it wasn't of God, what is their next step? Like, what advice would you give them as far as uh, if they asked about, well, what about divorce? Because God hates divorce, and they want to be obedient to the Word of God. So what advice would you give them? And I'll, I'll just hang up. And uh, uh, Before you hang up, are you talking about a woman that's living polygamy? Yeah, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, a woman that's in polygamy, uh -huh. and they're coming to the knowledge of the truth, and they want to be obedient to the Word of God, and they see that God hates divorce. So what advice would you give them? Okay, thank you. We'll answer on off the, line, off the air. Thanks. Do you want to take that? <laughs> well, if if the woman was had was married to another man, in God's eyes, because he was already married, I this is my own personal belief, but I don't think that God considers them to actually be married. So she would be justified in leaving that situation and getting away from it. There would be justification, I believe, I agree with Paul, that <clears throat> if she's living an illegal marital lifestyle, then she's justified to get away from it and leave her life of um, sinning against the Lord in that respect. Uh, we also have a call coming in uh, off the air. Someone is asking, who did Christ pray to? If we're teaching that there's only one God, what about God the Son and the Holy Spirit? Um, and now we're dealing with matters of the Trinity, which is a pretty deep subject we don't really want to get bogged down in tonight because it does take a long time to um, answer all the questions regarding the Trinity. But God is one. The Bible's very clear about that. And the Godhead is made up of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus came down here as God the Son, he was praying to God the Father. Um, we have Cora calling from Salt Lake City. Cora? Hello? Hello? You're on the air. Can we help you? Yes. Hello? Yes. Cora? Yes. Um, what, I, what I am thinking is Mormons still have polygamy in the temple. They still marry more than one wife in the temple. Yes, they we do. talk about that. Yes, they certainly do do that. Uh, a man can be sealed to more than one woman, to multiple women, but a woman cannot be sealed and well, are not right, sealed to multiple men. Me. That sure is. And when they believe that when they die and, and get on the other side, that they will have all those women they've been sealed to Absolutely. as wives that there. Is, so it's the same thing. It's the same doctrine. But don't, let, but don't say it right here. Right. That's exactly right. Thank you. Thank you, Cora. Bye. Okay, our next point on uh, mind manipulation is fear. 
What kind of fear did they instill in you? Well, the only fear factor is that if you don't, well, like when I left the group, the fear would be there, go to hell, because you're either going to stay in the group and do what they say, or you're out and you go to hell. And that's just as simple as that. And, that's, uh, and then they have guilt in if you're not doing what you should be doing on a job, or if you don't go where he tells you to go, where the, the leader tells you to go, why, then you have a certain amount of guilt for things like that, but uh, mostly guilt for leaving. Mm -hmm. Guilt for leaving, guilt and fear for leaving. Of course, the fear that was instilled in me was hellfire and damnation for thinking of leaving, for actually leaving, for swearing you'll never go back, <laughs> and uh, anything that we might say that would even jeopardize the safety of the group was something that they instilled fear in you not to talk Oh yeah, you wasn't, you wasn't to talk about anything outside the group. Right, right. To anyone outside. To the anyone group. outside the group. Mm -hmm. uh, these these groups also teach that they have special insight from God, and we all we briefly covered that already with the there being the only prophets. Uh, but let's go into that a little bit more. That that the truth that they have is from nowhere else. They can get it from nowhere else except for this leadership and whomever they may have around them as a group of of uh, leaders in the particular group. Independent thinking is not encouraged. That's true. Did you ever think independently? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did, but it isn't encouraged. You're just supposed to, supposed to not question. Just do what you're told and don't not, qu ask questions. Don't ask questions, and if you have them, don't talk about them. Um, but what about Jesus, though? Where's he in all of this? Is, doesn't the Bible say he's the only mediator? That's what the Bible says, yeah. and that's the truth. He is the... There's only, in Timothy it says, there's only one God and one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Jesus Christ. He's our only mediator. But in the group, they don't uh, worry about that. The, the leader can get something off the wall, and if he says that he got that, why well, you believed it, supposed to believe it. Supposed to believe it. Mm -hmm. And especially when this new leader take, took over, he was trying to to uh, instigate a lot of things that hadn't been done before and and some of those things I found very hard to accept and that was part of the time when I was struggling with with the truth. Mm -hmm. What about blind loyalty to the group? Did you did you go through that? Is that yes. did that uh, totally blind to anything except for what they wanted you to believe and yeah, do? That's what they teach. I have a quote that I would like to read here regarding the blind loyalty. Uh, it's from a book called Twisted Scriptures, and it's on page 252. And it says, members of abusive groups are led to believe that they have no other place to go if they truly want to follow God's will. This creates within them the feeling that no reason or purpose exists outside of the confines of this group. The next step is for controlling groups to cause members to believe that leaving the group is turning their back on God's will and that staying in the group is God's will. The result is that members eventually believe their group is virtually the only hope they have of entering the kingdom of God." Unquote. She goes on to explain that when people finally do manage to pull away from and leave these abusive groups, they often have a profound sense of loss of failure, of guilt, and sadness. The emotional upheaval will eventually fade if, the, if these people can be shown the contradictions, the lies, and the controlling methods that were used on them in their group. If anyone is out there and is going through this particular upheaval right now, may I suggest that there is help for you. You can go to shieldandrefuge.org on the contact page and find people there who have been there and done that and can help you through this if this is going on in your own life right now. We have uh, Emily calling. She has a question for Paul. She's from Salt Lake City. Emily? Hi, Doris. This is Emily. You know me. How are you? Hello, Emily. Um, this is, your question is for Paul? Yes. Okay. Hi, Paul. Um, I just had a couple of questions for you. Um, I haven't heard your salvation testimony, so I'd like to come, I'd like to know how you came to know Christ. And also, um, I just had a question, what was it like raising your children in a polygamy group? Like, did you have multiple wives and did you have a financial, um, sorry, financial strain 
as a result of having such a large group to take care of. Well, fortunately, I never did have a multiple wife, so <laughs> I didn't have that problem. But uh, as far as finding <laughs> <laughs> finding Jesus, uh, I had my oldest son and one of my daughters that did become Christians before I did, and they worked on me pretty hard. <laughs> and uh, like I s said earlier, I'd, I've done a lot of studying, a lot of praying about it. And I was over to my son Tony's place one night, and we were talking. He's the one that was a Christian. And he said, Dad, you really need to ask Jesus to come into your life. And the Holy Spirit convicted me. And all of a sudden, it all made sense to me. I remember thinking, yes, that's right. That's exactly right. And so I went home that night, and I confessed my sins and gave my life to Christ. Amen. Did that answer your question, Emily? Yes, it does. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, thank you, Emily, for calling. Bye-bye. Uh-huh, bye. Okay, what about the good work salvation that these groups talk about? That's part of the mind control and, yes, and the, it is. the bondage that they put us under. Yeah, it is definitely by works in, in the group and, and probably in all of these fundamentalist groups and in the Mormon church as well. It's salvation by works. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not of yourself. It's a gift from God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Right. That's pretty plain. It's very plain. But they have a long list, and each of them will have their own particular list. Uh, some of them will be the same, and some of the works will be different. But they have a, a generally a pretty long list of things that you need to do, like polygamy, the United Order, consecrate your money, obey the leader, give us your property, <laughs> you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever else whatever <laughs> makes you holy. Yeah. They, they have on that list to do. And I know when I was in, still in the group, uh, my worth and value was directly connected with my performance. If I performed or failed, I failed my folks, I failed God, uh, and so I w my worth was, uh, and value just wasn't there because uh, I'd failed doing whatever works that I was supposed to be doing, and then, of course, I would be rejected. We do have an, another call, Carolyn. Um, Carolyn? This is Dawn. Okay. Hey, um, I was calling, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I've watched your show a few times, and um, I wanted to say that I am from a, another fundamentalist group, not the Kingston one. Uh huh. I just wanted to let you know that um, I, I don't agree or fit in with any of what you talk about, and I am one of five wives, and I'm very happy. I'm not oppressed. I have my own thinking. I have a beautiful testimony of my Savior. And I know that we have to have him in our lives. He's our, our mediator. Our, he's, we all need him. And, but I want to express my, my voice and let you know that there are those out there who don't call in that do believe in our Savior, mm -hmm. and I have a deep testimony of Him, and know that He is more than important. He's critical and vital in our lives. But I am in another group, and I, I do feel for those in other groups that do have those struggles, because I have met them and known them, and mm -hmm. don't agree with what goes on. And I just kind of want to express myself and well, we thank you, Dawn, for calling in, and I have spoken with women before who claim to be happy in what they're doing, and, and I'm not going to argue with your happiness, and I'm very, very glad that you feel happy in what you're doing, uh, and that you feel like that you have a close relationship with your Savior, uh, but I would have to question uh, how you're following the New Testament scriptures that talks about that a man should only have one wife. Um, so did you want to say anything to that, Paul? Well, just that that's what uh, Paul made very clear in, in Scripture was that man, any man should be the husband of but one wife. And in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 7, verse 2, it says a man is to have his own wife and a woman is to have her own husband. So thank you, Dawn, for calling. I have 
have my own husband. Um, thank you. I also wanted to comment on the other. You were talking about women in divorce. Um, uh huh. And the other women that you say can just leave because they're not married, but there is a first wife there that is part of it. And I just wanted to point that out. And I also wanted you to know that for all those women listening, I. Don, uh, when when a, a woman leaves a polygamy situation and she's not the first wife, she's not the legal wife, the legal wife would need to go through a legal divorce, but uh, a woman who is a second or third or fifth wife would not have to go to a legal divorce. I do appreciate your call. We have another call coming in I need to take. Thank you. Good night. Good night. We have Robert calling from Salt Lake City. Um, Robert, are you there? Okay, thank you for calling in. What can we help you with? Uh, Doris and Paul, uh, thank you so much for your Christian witness uh, this evening. I appreciate it very, very much, and God bless you for the ministry uh, of your work. I'd just like to make a quick comment uh, and then ask a question. Um, my great-great-grandfather uh, was a very prominent uh, academician in Ireland and left the Methodist uh, Christian faith uh, for the Mormon cult, and what a disastrous situation uh, that poor man endured attempting to take another wife, and what a terrible legacy, I have to say honestly, uh, that he left for, the, for his family. Um, but I hope and pray that, uh, that we can reach out uh, to these uh, people in these fundamentalist polygamous groups, including the uh, the major uh, Mormon group here in Salt Lake and wherever they are in the world, uh, I'd just like to ask a question. Uh, I wonder if uh, if you and Paul know how many different or how many individual polygamous groups are there uh, in Utah or uh, throughout the United States, uh, perhaps even in the world. I'm just wondering if you might be able to comment on that. <laughs> Don't know if anyone really knows. Do you know? Do you have a well, count? <laughs> in Utah, I've heard the figure of a hundred, but oh. that could be way off. I'm not sure. There, there's probably a half a dozen main main groups, um, but Robert, there's also so many independents where they don't have a group affiliation, uh, and there would be really no way to find out how many of them there are. And thank you for your encouraging words uh, tonight. We do appreciate what you've said. And I have read many stories like you've talked about your relative who joined the Mormon church and disaster ensued when they tried to live that doctrine of polygamy that was so uh, prevalent in those times. Okay, well, thank you, Doris and Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good night. Bye. I called him Frank. His name is Robert. Hello, this is Frank. Hello. Hello, Frank from Provo. Yeah, uh... I'm going to speak up because all the calls sound pretty, pretty dim on the on the TV. Oh, okay. But, uh, let me tell you, I've 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 been struggling with. I'm in the, the mainstream Mormon church. Uh huh. And I've been struggling with them, and I really found Christ a few years ago. Mm. And uh, everything you say about polygamists and polygamy groups applies to the Mormon church. The the fear tactics. The the the, the the, uh, all, uh, everything about mm -hmm. the uh, uh, true church, one true church, and the prophets cannot be lead you astray, and all the rest. Right. Of it. It's the exact same thing. It's, it's, it's it applies to both. To both. Uh -huh. And I'm really struggling with it now with my family and everything. And and uh, you know I I don't know how it's going to end, but it's so. Have you made the decision pretty, to leave the church uh, then? What's that? Have you made the decision to leave the Mormon Church, or are you still a member? What What are you doing with that? Uh, I, I'm still I'm still gathering evidence and ammunition. Okay. And, well, uh, if you uh, need any help, let us okay. know. Our t Our email is tv at aboutpolygamy dot com. Yeah, uh, I, I I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because it's 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 waking up some people. I think. We hope so. We certainly pray so. Okay. Thanks. Uh huh. Thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. Good night. 
Okay, uh, you can call us at 973-8820 for any folks who would like to continue to call in and ask us questions as we continue on with uh, the, the uh, mind control techniques that different groups will use to keep their members. What about the financial empire part? <laughs> uh, well, the story that we always had was save your money, save your money, don't spend any money, turn it in. And you was actually judged by what you did in that regard. If you was saving your money and turning it in, well, then you was in good shape in the group. But uh, financially, they control everything. And, and they take your money. They take they, it and uh, put it in it. their name. And, and if you want any out, then well, you have to be drilled well, Just like it. I said, when, when I bought my house, first thing you want me to do is sign, it, sign the title over and sign the deed over. And People have done that. I know of people that have done that, and, and it was really hard to get it back. And it usually cost them a lot of money extra, so it was the money factor. Mm -hmm. But they would have to pay a lot more to get their house, get their title back than what they paid for the house in the first place. And mm -hmm. I've seen that in several cases. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it true that they don't believe in um, the inheritance law? The, of inheritance that if someone dies they get everything and, and the family doesn't? The family can have it if they pay for it. Oh. <laughs> if somebody dies and their kids want they've got they will go through they'll inventory everything out and make them pay for it. That's interesting. We weren't offered to anything to pay for to get some of well we won't get into that. <laughs> okay what about uh, the a lot of these groups will spend um, much effort and at all costs to present to prevent the 99 percent of the people below to um, make sure that they support the one percent above do you see that happening in in the polygamy groups yeah in in as much as that if if you're not part of the family the top part then uh, you're not important you you're just one of the peons you're not one of god's favorite if you're not no. Okay, we have uh, coming from Kaysville, a caller by the name of Steve. Steve? Yes. Yes, welcome to the show. Okay. Yes. You, you need to turn down your television. I just did. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you so much for your show, uh, Doris and Paul. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm watching as an outsider. Uh, not being from here, even though I had friends and I was recruited here to BYU, but did not attend because I thought it was real strange. <laughs> I didn't understand uh, okay. what was going on. <laughs> but um, uh, one of my jobs when I came here was installing satellite, and I, I went to install a satellite at someone's home, and I called ahead of time just to let them know I was coming in, and, uh, and it was a woman, and, and she... Um, I worked in, 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 as a psychiatric technician for years, so we, we began talking, and, and all of a sudden she began to pour out her heart regarding her, her you know, her husband's polygamy and how uh, the church had lied to her is what she began to explain to me. Um, and, and she was leaving her husband at that moment and told me I might as well not come because she was, um, she was leaving after 25 years. And wow. he married her when she was 17. And um, it was very, very sad, very sad. Um, but no. what I found really interesting was the fact that if I invited her, I'm a Christian, uh -huh. and I invited her to, to attend church to see the truth or just to study the Bible, and she was just absolutely anti-church. She did not want anything to do with the church or the Bible or... Now, was this a woman that was from a polygamy group? Yes, she was. Uh, that really is not unusual. There are uh, many people who leave these groups and because they've been told that their miserable lifestyle was uh, commanded by God, they don't want to, want to have anything to do with a God that demands that kind of sacrifice and pain. And so they will completely throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I did that for 25 years. Paul was very blessed because he, he did not go through that process. Um, he turned to Jesus immediately, which is pretty darn awesome. But uh, a lot of people do um, go have that process, and some of them will never find the truth because of their bad experience with the polygamy groups. Yes. Well, one other uh, the, uh, comment I wanted to make, though, was 
was um, how they, uh, and this this is this is most uh, actually most cults um, have a tendency to separate themselves or turn away from other groups, and and, and you see that seem like that should be such a red flag. You know, mm -hmm. we're the only ones that everyone else is something else, you know, something other than... Right. Would you, you like know, to comment on that, Paul? The, polls, you know? the, f the fact that they claim to be the only ones who... Yeah, that's, that's very, very consistent with any group, that they figure that they're the only ones that uh, are right. Nobody else can be and nobody else is. So that's very common. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, that's true. Well, I appreciate you guys taking my call. And Thank you. It's a great show, great thank, show. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate that. Mm, bye. Gay in Bountiful? Yes. Yes, thank you for calling. What can we help you with? Uh, you know, I want to say something that this program is so offensive to me that um, I'm a Mormon. Uh -huh. I have a testimony of Jesus Christ. And you're talking about the Mormons, that we just live with guilt. We have a blind loyalty to the group. We are considered an abusive group. They put us in bondage. We give all your money. He had indicated that we have to give our money to the church, that he had to deed his We're property. talking about polygamous groups, ma'am. We're not talking about the Mormon church. Well, you're also really downing the Mormons as well, you're no, doing it. We're, we're dealing with the polygamy groups here, and some of the groups, what they do, and some, some they don't all do it, but some do, and we're just talking about some of the things that some of the polygamy groups do. Well, you've indicated, you know, the polygamists from the Mormons, you know, before and so forth. And to me, you're really linking them all together. Well, we're sorry that you take it that way, but we're talking about present-day Mormon polygamy groups. Well, Thank you. Is, you're also putting the Mormons into the same type cult. Well, we haven't done that. We've just talked about polygamy, and I thank you for calling, Gay. Thank you. Uh-huh. We have an offline question. Do fundamentalists believe in three degrees of heaven? Carolyn is asking that question. Paul, do they believe that? Yes, they do. The group I was in did. But one thing that if you want to be in the third degree, which is the highest, you have to have more than one wife. It's just How many wives do you have to have? Oh, I don't know if there's a limit or not, or <laughs> a <laughs> minimum not. number that you need to have. But, <laughs> I've heard uh, there's three. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that. I don't know mm -hmm. if they all group believe that. but. Okay, we have a call for, for, from Ken in Orem. He disagrees totally that polygamy is only when, well, let's talk to Ken. Okay, here, here. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, I, I, I got some comments that uh, basically the, the LDS Church does not believe in polygamy, uh, does not practice polygamy, because in order to be a polygamist, uh, you, the, you have to be married to those while, while they are living. When they are dead, you know, it does not consider polygamy. It, you know, even though you may be sealed to more than one wife, it is not considered polygamy because polygamy, the definition of polygamy is while they are alive. Okay. Paul, do you want to address that? I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> I, uh, I was unaware until today that the Mormon church did that, so I don't know. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, about the, about the Godhead that, that uh, the, the you know the LDS believes in the Godhead you know as three three distinct beings you know which which to me makes more sense because if we are created in the image of, of our Father in heaven, how can we be created in the image of someone who is three in one? Well, we are three in one. We're body, soul, and spirit. Um, and we're created in God's image as far as when Adam was created, he was created in, in total righteousness. Uh, he wasn't a sinner. Uh, of course, we've lost that image now after the sinning in the garden. But, uh, but, the, but, but we're not called three different people. No, we're not. <clears throat> you know, and, and, you know, because... Uh, uh, Again, Ken, we're not going to go into the Trinity Doctrine tonight. It's, it takes too much time, and we really don't have that. Uh, we state only what the Bible teaches, and that is that there's only one God, and that Jesus is God, the Father is God, and so is the Holy Spirit. If you'd like to carry on this discussion... Uh, the, the Bible teaches the three separate... separate they're, like I said earlier, they're, they are one God, and there is only one God. If you would like to carry this conversation on, you can email us at tv at about polygamy.com. God is the title. 
God is the being that created us, and there are three people in the Godhead. God is, God is his title. Thank you, Ken. Well, good night. Don't want to argue with uh, any of our callers, and we don't have very much time left tonight. Uh, we certainly haven't covered all of the things that we wanted to cover with Paul, um, and so maybe we'll have to do this again <laughs> if you want to. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to, to say that next week we do have a special guest um, and is someone who knows almost everything there is to know about early Mormons, uh, polygamy and early Mormonism, although often criticized for her work. She is a stickler for accuracy, so please join us next week as we have Sandra Tanner on for our guest. And for those uh, out there who are in polygamy and who rely upon the biblical characters who live to polygamy to justify living it yourselves, please know this, that you can learn by their mistakes. Um, you can learn by their mistakes, and the Bible tells us in Romans 15, 4, that whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning. They had the Bible, or we have the Bible now. They didn't have it then. And so you can't blame what they're doing on the reason that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, God's salvation plan is simple and it's clear. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It doesn't say that eternal life is through living polygamy. And it doesn't say that eternal life is through living the united order. But Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He died for us because we're sinners. He wants us in heaven, but we can't go there unless we go there His way. It's a gift. We don't work for a gift. It's by faith. We're told that already. Eternal life is not through polygamy. It's through what Jesus has already done for us. So why not turn to Him today? If you could, <clears throat> pardon me, if you could get to heaven any other way, then Jesus Christ died on the cross in vain. Uh, please join us next week uh, for Sandra Tanner and Paul. Thank you so much for being here. We My too pleasure. appreciate your input on the subject. Um, we thank you for uh, coming and inviting us into your evening tonight and that we hope you enjoyed the program. Join us next week. And we just ask you to take the time to get in the Bible and claim all its promises that God has for you. Good night and God bless.